This is the lecture for uh, chapter five of Mill. There's uh, three points in this lecture, so there's three of me on the screen. And we'll start with uh, the first point, which is the objection from justice. So Mill starts this chapter, he says, down through the ages, one of the strongest objections to the doctrine that utility or happiness is the criterion of right and wrong has been based on the idea of justice. And the rest of the chapter is sort of responding to that objection, that one of the strongest objections. Uh, but he never really like explains the objection. This is not because he's a bad philosopher or anything. It's because at the time Mill was writing, uh, he was sort of defending utilitarianism against people who didn't like utilitarianism and explaining utilitarianism in more detail. But utilitarianism was sort of already in the culture. Uh, the people Mill is writing to uh, with this book are people who are aware of utilitarianism as a moral theory. It's not like they're first being introduced to it here. So they all know what Mill is talking about when he says, oh, there's the strongest objection or one of the strongest objections. They all understand this objection from justice. They've heard it before when they've looked into utilitarianism. Maybe this is the reason they're not a utilitarian, things like this. So Mill isn't bothering to even explain it, but we should explain it so that we know what he is uh, talking about. So what does he mean this uh, one of the strongest objections has been based on justice? So there's lots of ways of explaining the objection. Here's one way of uh, introducing it. So uh, imagine that you're in a very small town and uh, there's a, the police in the town uh, know that a murder has been committed. Everybody in the town knows that a murder has been committed. It's a small village, so there's no hiding this. And the police don't know who committed the murder. There's a stranger who arrived in the village uh, yesterday or something. Uh, they're just passing through, basically. And everybody suspects the stranger just because they're a stranger. Uh, the police know the stranger didn't do it. The stranger has an alibi. So the police know somebody's guilty, but it's not the stranger. But all the uh, villagers suspect the stranger. And what they want to do is uh, they want to kill the stranger. They want to sort of hang the stranger uh, from a tree or something. And the police know that if they try to stop the villagers, it's going to be very messy. The villagers want justice, or they want vengeance, basically, for the murder and they want to get this stranger who they think is responsible. And so if the police try to defend the stranger, they're probably gonna have to kill people in uh, the village. This is, it's gonna be a mess. They'll be able to save the stranger, but only at the cost of many lives. Maybe many innocent lives are gonna get hurt and like the rioting, things like this. Maybe police are gonna get hurt and die. So we have this choice basically allow the villagers to kill the stranger and save lots of lives or defend the stranger at the cost of lots of lives. And a lot of people think the police should defend the stranger. It would be wrong to allow the villagers to kill the stranger for a murder the stranger didn't commit. That would be wrong. That would be unjust, basically. That violates justice. And the problem is that if you're just counting utility, you might think, look, it might maximize utility if they kill the stranger. Of course, the stranger gets a lot of negative utility, but uh, we avoid a very violent riot and confrontation between the villagers and the police officers. So uh, if our standard is utility, then maybe we should allow the injustice to happen. Now, this is just a sort of, uh, philosophers call it like a toy example. Uh, it's a very like simplified example to set up the problem. Of course, utilitarianism actually isn't worried about like this sort of actual example. And these sort of actual examples, utilitarianism will probably say, well, no, don't kill the stranger because if you let villagers just get in the habit of murdering strangers whenever they think the stranger is responsible for a crime, that's actually going to lead to much less utility and blah, blah, blah. So of course, in real life, typically justice and utility are going to go together. So as Mill puts it, uh, the concept of justice, they have thought, conflicts with the concept of expediency, or in other words, utility. Though they commonly admit, so the objectors commonly admit, that in the long run, justice and expediency go together as a matter of fact. 
So the story I just told, of course, is unrealistic. In the long run, typically doing the just thing will lead to more utility. But it's not like that must happen, according to the objection. The objection says, look, in cases sort of like this, not the literal case of the villager, but cases like that, there are at least some cases where justice is not going to go together with utility. So some stuff having to do with crime might be like this. So if I send somebody to jail uh, for a very long time for a crime, maybe this is more than they deserve, but everybody looks at this really harsh sentence and they say, whoa, that's, that's way harsh, way harsher than it should be. I'm not going to commit any crimes because I don't want to get in prison for like 60 years for stealing uh, a potato. So maybe that would promote utility more because one person goes to jail for 60 years, but that stops everybody from stealing potatoes and breaking the law and stuff. So the thought is, look, there could be cases where justice comes apart from utility or expediency, as Mill puts it. There could be cases where doing something unjust could lead to more utility. And that's the objection. The objection is utilitarianism must be a bad moral theory because in cases where it would be unjust to promote utility, we shouldn't promote utility. We should do justice instead. Um, and there's a Latin phrase, uh, fiat justicia ruit calum or something, which is uh, let justice be done uh, though the heavens fall. And the sort of sentiment behind that is like justice is the most important thing. Uh, no matter what the consequences are, you must always promote justice. And that sort of thinking, uh, something that Kant, for instance, would find compelling, is one that the utilitarian seems to have a lot of trouble with. So Mill's point in this chapter that you're going to read, chapter five, is to respond to that kind of objection, the objection from justice, that sometimes justice is not going to lead to utility. But in those cases, it seems like we should choose justice rather than utility. Now, of course, if you've been listening to this and you say, no, in those cases, we choose utility, then no problem. But Mill didn't write this chapter for you. He wrote this chapter for people who are convinced by the argument from justice. And a lot of people in Mill's time and a lot of people right now are convinced by this argument. They think it just rules out utilitarianism completely. So that's the first point, the objection from justice. The second point is just a very, very minor point, but it's a, a little interesting. So on page 32, Mill talks about uh, how in a lot of languages, the etymology of the word that corresponds to just points distinctly to an origin connected with law. And he gives Latin, Greek, German, and French examples. I looked up a bunch of words for justice in a bunch of languages in India. And uh, all the, in fact, all the ones I could find, I stopped after five or six or something, uh, they all lined up with this. So the word like, uh, for instance, like nyaya is an often justice or something like Naya is something like justice, and that's from uh, Sanskrit for rule or law. Um, so this kind of etymology, this example he uses, shows up not just in the uh, European languages that he's got as examples here, but uh, in lots of other languages as well. So that's kind of fun. Uh, it doesn't really mean much, like as he points out here, he's not building a lot on this example, but still kind of a fun point. So that's point number two. Point number three, uh, we get another illustration of this sort of question. Is Mill a rule or an act utilitarian? How should we think about utilitarianism? So uh, in pages, well, the whole chapter, he's giving his sort of utilitarian account of what is justice. And where we've gotten by page 40 is that he says, justice is a name for certain kinds of moral rules that concern the essentials of human well-being more closely and therefore are more absolutely binding than any other rules for the guidance of life. So the thought is, look, morality is about coming up with rules to guide our conduct in life, and then justice refers to certain of those rules, the rules that concern the essentials of life, of well-being. So you read that, and some people say, look, this sounds like Mill is a rule utilitarian, and you can go back to the earlier lecture for discussion of what it is to be a rule utilitarian. Clearly, he thinks morality consists of moral rules, and he's given us a description of some of these rules, which are justice. So that's what Mill is all about. He's a rule utilitarian, and justice picks out a subset of these moral rules. 
And so that's, and in fact, like, look, the moral rules that forbid mankind to hurt one another are more vital than blood. So like, clearly he's thinking in rules. He is a rule utilitarian. So that's the argument for thinking Mill is a rule utilitarian. But then sort of as he's talking about these rules in various places, and this is easiest to see on uh, 43, he says, look, from what I've said, it appears that justice is a name for certain moral requirements or rules which, regarded collectively, stand higher in the scale of social utility and are therefore more bindingly obligatory than others. So that still sounds like rule utilitarianism. These are sort of higher ranked rules than other rules. Though particular cases may occur in which some other social duty is important enough to overrule one of the general maxims of justice. Any of those maxims could be overruled in that way. Thus, to save a life, it may not be merely allowable, but a duty to steal or take by force the necessary food or medicine, or to kidnap the only qualified medical practitioner and compel him to serve. So here it sounds like Mill is saying, look, here are the rules of justice, and they're generally very important, but sometimes you want to break some of those rules. There's a duty of justice that says don't steal and a duty of justice that says don't kidnap, but sometimes you break those rules for something more important. And if you break the rules when there's something more important, that's just another way of saying, look, do whatever leads to most utility. If the following the rules leads to the most utility, then you follow the rules. But sometimes you gotta break the rules to, follow, to get the most utility, and then you break the rules. It's just very simple act utilitarianism, do whatever gets you the most utility. Usually that means following rules, sometimes that means breaking rules. So I'm not a rule utilitarian, I'm not saying morality consists in rules that you're supposed to follow. I'm saying I'm an act utilitarian, do whatever leads to the best utility. Often that'll be following the rules, but sometimes it isn't. So uh, that doesn't solve the question, you know, there's arguments on both sides. Is he a rule utilitarian? Is he an act utilitarian? Uh, but we get another illustration of it here in chapter five.